Uh, welcome everyone. And uh, this is the urban planning program at GSAP. I'm Wei Ping Wu, program director and a professor in the program as well. And like to really welcome you. Uh, this is an extraordinary time and cities and the field of urban planning really need people like you. And so again, a big welcome. And we will be recording the session. Uh, Join in with me are also the program manager, Emily, and the panel of students whom I will introduce towards the end of my presentation. So in the first 20 to 25 minutes, I would like to give you a run through of the program, why um, you wanna consider our program. Of course, I want all of you to be here. We wanna make sure, however, that whatever your interests are match with what we have to offer. And so I will do some um, brief introduction of the curriculum. I would also try to answer many of the questions that have been submitted prior to the uh, open house. And then some of, the, uh, some of the questions will be answered by the panel of students. So this is a time of crisis, many folks, many different crises. And uh, studying urban planning in New York City during crisis time is both challenging and, ex and exciting, really. And New York City, as you can see from this chart, has perhaps the most severe degree of inequality among all cities in the United States. And this inequality is showing its ugly face during COVID time. New York City also uh, is a major um, city that will be severely affected by climate change and sea level rise. So what are we doing at this time, right? With these multiple crises social, racial, and climate justice are these key aspects of our school and our program. I'm not going to go through all of these, and, um, but uh, GSAP as a whole are making significant efforts in terms of uh, thinking through um, diversity, inclusion, anti-racism, and confronting the challenges of the day. And in the planning program, we've had long-standing commitment to social, racial, and climate justice. And as you can see also um, my notes that we have a number of student-driven activities, which I'm very proud of. More importantly, I think our curriculum is dynamic. Um, later on, I will give you an outline of other key aspects of the curriculum. But as you can see from here, uh, that just in the last year and this current academic year, we've had a number of new courses to really prepare our students for at least three things, right? The, the current crisis, the emerging needs for planners beyond traditional roles of planning. And third really is to um, take advantage of our connection with a large number of seasoned practitioners in and around New York to really be firmly connected with practice. And so and that will be really this dynamic and flexible curriculum uh, is one aspect I would say compared to many other planning programs that we are very, very strong. And I am very involved in the Association of Collegiate Schools of Planning as a past president. Uh, I, so I, under, I know many other programs. I also have been working uh, in three different planning programs in my career. So uh, when I say that, I, I do feel some very degree, some strong degree of confidence of what we're doing here. And as you can also see beyond the curriculum, we have incredible intellectual life. So planning uh, program uh, hosts a weekly lecture in planning series. And you can see from the titles for this semester, it's very timely. It really captures the spirits of the moment and really engages us in the uh, urgent conversations of the time. And COVID is of course the elephant in the room, right? Uh, we are all facing this very difficult time. 
And uh, the school has invested tremendous energy and the resources since the summer to really make sure that COVID is not going to be uh, stopping us from this engaging and dynamic style of learning. So we are truly hybrid, or we, we call it high flex. And so you can see to the very left is our original um, urban planning suite. We have reconfigured uh, all three parts of the suite. And now we have 46 computers, all uh, socially spaced at each time. At any given time, 23 students can be there. Uh, so we do two rotations for GIS lab and then also other working hours. So you can see um, on top is the GIS lab hybrid session this week on the uh, right. So the GIS lab is for first year students. And then uh, on the bottom is the thesis workshop hybrid uh, also this week. Uh, that is for second year students. So for each class, we have this one hybrid element so that to allow that in-person interaction and learning continue to happen, but to also give flexibility to students who have COVID related challenges to really be part of the large community. So that is really the current time. And, and with that though, we continue to be committed to the um, dynamic curriculum and the rich history uh, that have been built into this program. And so this just gives you an outline of the various key milestones of the program. Empowering this program uh, is a set of dedicated full-time faculty and who uh, work on um, many different fronts of scholarship and applied research and connect with students um, both through courses, all of the uh, full-time faculty teach in the core curriculum, uh, even though we're small in number. That small in number actually is by design. That's because we have a fantastic group of dedicated um, adjunct faculty. This is just a very um, select list, but listed there so you can see the kind of backgrounds, the kind of full-time responsibilities and, um, and who they are. And this I would say is the second feature of our program. And that is we are truly a professional school, not just urban planning, all of the programs in the school except the PhD programs, we are very anchored in practice. We um, connect with practitioners and applied scholars on a daily, weekly basis. And they are, um, in, they are an essential part of our students' learning, uh, mentoring, and connection with future career and internships. And so very quickly for outline of the curriculum. And as of now, all of our students are full-time and that is two year program with 60 points. Um, as you can see on the bottom of the slide, we actually recently received New York state approval to have a part-time option and that, that is assumed that uh, one of you, if you're interested, you must have at least two year full-time or four year part-time experience uh, in planning related fields prior to application. And then when you come in, you take eight consecutive semesters or four consecutive years to complete the program. You complete the same number of uh, points and everything else is exactly the same in terms of requirements. Um, so that requirements include 27 core requirements, not 27, 27 points of core requirements. I include five core courses, studio in the second semester of first year, and then thesis or professional capstone in the second year. It's a two semester sequence. Uh, one of you have posed the question about uh, what's the percentage breakdown of thesis versus capstone. Capstone is also a very new um, option, as I mentioned, our curriculum is dynamic. So this is the second year professional capstone has been pursued by uh, students. So last year we had about 15%, roughly eight or nine students out of a class of a uh, little over 50 students uh, pursuing professional capstone. The difference is you need to have a real client uh, to work with. 
And then in terms of electives, there are 33 points of electives. At least 12 of them need to be in a concentration and which you can see there are four concentrations which I will detail in a little bit. And uh, many of our students, in fact, about 40% of our students actually choose two concentrations because they want to uh, really be more broad based. In fact, we would like to say at Columbia Urban Planning Program, we are training students to be generalists. That is to say they can uh, um, work with large number of different issues in the planning field and related field and in emerging roles. Um, and so the courses or the concentrations are there to really help students organize their courses and really think through what they want to pursue uh, down the road. And so beyond those um, 27 plus 12, right, 39 points that you need to complete within the program, uh, the other electives, which are at least 21 points, and some students and many students take more than that, can be taken across GSAP and across Columbia. And we give students a very extensive list of courses that um, they can, that are really relevant to planning and they can pursue across Columbia. So I would say a third characteristic of the program uh, that uh, we consider quite different from other programs and we are very strong uh, is this flexibility and, and the cross training that students can get. And, uh, and so that's just a sample program of uh, if you pursue full-time four semesters. And uh, of course, um, this semester because of COVID and hybrid, uh, students that actually can take up to 25 points. Uh, usually it's 19 points. As you can see, the first year, more required courses and elements. The second year, uh, you have lots of flexibility to pursue your interests. And there are also many dual degree programs with planning as I have listed there. And we have students in every single program, uh, not every year, but um, in most years. And so if you're interested, you can apply now uh, to both programs or in your first year in Columbia, either at urban planning or at the other degree home, you can apply across. So you have to be admitted into both programs separately. And we give a lot of guidance to dual degree students. And you can also check out through our website, which I will give you the link at the end. I would say the fourth real significant unique feature of the program is our global outlook. And this is our, of course, also concentration called international planning and development. Global, we take it in a very broad sense, but we also take it in a very comparative sense. We want to situate our students in a way that the world has coming to us and COVID really shows that, right? So even if you are not traveling, you're not going to another country, the world is right in your backyard and front yard. So to understand the global movements of people, capital and climate change, such global issues is one key of this outlook. And second is to really think through if cities are confronting very similar challenges and problems, can we learn from each other? Can global South solutions be the key for global North problems, you know, especially COVID? So you can see the kind of uh, courses we introduce to um, allow our students to pursue their, that global outlook. So many students who do not choose the international planning and development concentration uh, take some of these courses because they are very uh, useful. And so you can see also our students travel to other places around the world for travel studio. That is of course handicapped by COVID. Um, and we really hope that we will have at least some other opportunity right now through LIPS and others to connect with scholars and local experts virtually. Of course, um, because we are in architecture school, our curriculum is very grounded in the built environment, especially the urban built environment. So this concentration has perhaps the most extensive choices of courses. And as you can see, you can even pursue, if you have interest in urban design, we have a couple of questions about that. In this here, you can also take 
some seminars in the urban design program. As I mentioned, our students take electives across GSAP. All GSAP electives are open to all students in GSAP. So uh, built environment is the most popular concentration for our students. And so this, you can see the kind of work students do. And the third concentration is community and economic development. And it's probably where we can see our commitment to social and racial justice most commonly reflected. But I have to say that focus on justice is throughout our core curriculum. I know that the theory and history class students this semester are debating, right? A lot about you know, how do we overcome the barriers? Do we change the system? Do we make changes within the system? I understand the debates have been ongoing every week. And so you can see the kind of courses we have there and, uh, and the kind of work that our students have done in the past. Urban analytics is our newest concentration, but it's increasingly become the, one of the most popular. And we are among the very first few urban planning programs in the country to have this focus and to really prepare our students to engage with technology with sufficient skills and depth so that we can be in the center of the conversations about urban technology, about smart city. We can complain all we want that technology is not catering to the needs of different groups of um, urban communities, but until planners know the language, can be involved in the discussion and at the center of the discussion, that is not going to change. So that is our goal. And I would say that's our fifth very unique feature that how important we play, um, we place analytics uh, in the curriculum and a critical use of analytics, not just we know the data, we know the methods, but we know how inequality, lack of access and asymmetry and privacy issues continue to plague technology and it, their applications. So you can see students work um, using spatial technology, understanding climate change. And this just gives you the studio wraps it all, right? So we, the various different kinds of studio projects last year, and some confronting climate change. And we also pivoted to some uh, New York issues about reopening streets. And so um, even though we were very much handicapped by you know, middle of the semester lockdown, I think students made huge progress. So the last aspect of the program, I would say probably the last, not the last, but the last that I, I would outline, um, important feature of our program is the connection we provide our students um, to a professional career. And so as you can see here that, uh, oh, yeah, so we have a number of ways of helping our students both when they are in the program as well as when they are ready to move and you know, uh, to the professional world, um, both through the program office, through the faculty advisors and the um, student mentors, particular, oops, I should have turned it off in terms of the timing. So I, my apologies. Um, and then student mentors about writing and digital skills and this uh, mentorship program with the alumni one-on-one -on -one, and is very, very important for us. And we started that about three years ago and it's been going quite strong this year, about 30 students in the second year class um, are in the program. And so um, the extensive kind of services, career guidance that we give to, our, to planning students uh, is something that we are very proud of and continue to build up. And so many of you asked, so what do we do after we trained as an urban planning student? And so this year we developed this um, career path a matrix for our students. And I think one of the students on the panel actually suggested this. I think, you know, you'll remember um, one of you. I, I, and um, the example organizations, I would say 80% of them are organizations where we have alumni working in. And so we did fill in some blanks where alumni are not as numerous. And so we use this to help our students consider, you know, uh, what kind of career path or path 
uh, that you want to consider, you know, what kind of organizations can be in those paths, and then, then what kind of courses in a large scheme of things that they should consider. So we have 13 uh, career paths that we have designed so far based on what our alumni have been working. And so more information once you get into the program uh, will be provided. So the career services in also include uh, conversations with alumni. This of course was pre-COVID time, but we continue to do that. In fact, just two weeks ago, we had alumni networking uh, virtual um, uh, event. Uh, so a, lot like, a little bit like a speed dating, right? So um, six or seven students meet with one or two alum for about 20 minutes and then moving on and have this conversation of just really try to understand uh, as a planning graduate, what you can do. And we have a small scale of career fair, uh, usually every um, February, and where we invite organizations, mostly around New York area and a little bit beyond to come talk to our students, give information. They're not like a real interview type of career fair. We also have federal agencies like FEMA and some um, other uh, government agencies and private consulting firms. And uh, we are having challenge in terms of getting nonprofit sector. Usually we get one or two. So we're hoping to continue to um, attract them. I guess if you would say that this advantage of Columbia's urban planning program is we are quite expensive. There's no doubt about that. And so in a way that our students do end up graduating and go into uh, organizations that are more likely to be in the private sector. So over half of our alumni who graduated uh, between 19, uh, 2013 and 2019, the five years, uh, work in private sector. And, uh, and then another uh, more than 30% work in government public sector and then so the nonprofit is a very small um, percentage. And so, you know, students have to pay back their loans. And so where they work is sometimes predicated upon uh, the kind of projected income. So I say that because I used to teach at Tufts and I know that program is very dedicated to nonprofit sector work and the students tend to go to that sector much more. So if we say we have a disadvantage or weakness and that's definitely one of them. And then we also take our students to different planning offices and organizations and agencies to visit. And we connect our students with um, alumni at American Planning Association's annual conference and fabulous end of year show that of course pre-COVID, but you can see the kind of products, the kind of work that our students are doing. And this is primarily, um, urban analytics and building sensors and gathering data and uh, analyze data uh, through um, mostly uh, Python or R, but also machine learning types of uh, skills. And then in the distance were more of the um, GS um, posters and on the TV screen is videos that our students made for their urban design and studio uh, courses. And this is our proudly our urban magazine, student run magazine. And I, we have uh, at least one editor on the student panel if you, any of you are interested in um, asking about that. Okay, so all that uh, materials, a lot to digest. Uh, so I just wanna spend one last minute on your application and the admissions uh, related questions. Of course, you'll have more, I will, um, also encourage you to get in touch with us. So our students come from a variety of backgrounds, all the way from art to design, to math, science, business, you name it, political science, geography, everything. Of course, I have to say probably design related um, backgrounds is the, lars, the, the largest, probably at least a third. And then uh, social sciences would, um, be the next, you know, um, geography, political science, urban studies, history, um, economics, and then science is probably the uh, smallest, science and engineering is probably the smallest group, but they do come from everywhere, not just backgrounds, also in terms of country, uh, in terms of 
uh, prior experience. We very much value experience relevant to planning. Um, we are now increasingly, and, and some of the students can uh, tell you uh, on the panel, that we now have students who have more than 10 years experience or more than five years and so on. So we very much value that. If you don't have that and the kind of experience you've had uh, through internship, through projects should also be outlined in your application, right? So if you don't have the experience, what we really want to know, especially through the statement that you will write is your understanding of the planning field, you know? Why do you want to come to planning? What do you expect to do with this degree, right? What do you want to do after you get the degree? So, and then what kind of experience you have um, with um, analytical methods? Because this year we're waiving GRE. So we want you to reflect on your analytical abilities that could be quantitative, that could be qualitative, or could be both, it could be spatial, could be other kinds of analytical methods. We want to hear about those in your statement and make sure at least one, preferably at least two of your recommendation letters can reflect on your academic preparation. So if you have been out of the school for a long time, make sure to get, to get in touch with at least one professor who can uh, talk about your academic preparation. And so in the end, about one third of our students receive financial aid. Uh, if if I have to say there's another disadvantage is we are uh, continue to expand the range of financial aid and to make sure that not only it's based on merit, it's also based on need. So that's a dynamic situation as well. So to conclude, I would encourage you to check out our website to particularly check out this open house resource page in the second link uh, that um, we pull together lots of information about the program, lots of student work, lots of uh, the urban magazine issues uh, so that you know what students are doing while um, you know, they're in the program. So last but not least, reach out through the email uh, and I hope to hear from many of you. So that is my presentation. I went a little bit over time, um, but I like to now open up to our student panel uh, and let me introduce, so you could just holler when I say your name and I'm going to say your name just based on where I see you on my screen. So they will answer a number of questions that were posted before the open house. And then, um, that depending on whether we have questions in the chat box, which you should feel free to type in, that we will answer some more questions. That will probably go on until about 9.45 or 9.50. And then we'll break into three breakout rooms uh, for you to meet some of the um, current students a little bit on a more intimate scale. And then, uh, Emily, our uh, program manager. Emily, can you raise your hand? Thank you, Emily. Uh, will be your um, best friend, hopefully for at least the next few months if you have any questions about um, the applications and missions. And uh, so Emily and I will stay in the main room if you have, you have any questions. So we'll go on uh, with that for until about 10, 10 or 10, 15 each. All right, so let me get to the students. Zainab. Um, is a second year student. Hi everyone, welcome. Yep. And Sifan. Hi everyone, I'm Sifan. I'm the second year um, student. Yep, second year also. Um, uh, she is really remote now, truly kind of a uh, 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 virtual. Brady. Hi everyone. First year. Moses. Hi everyone. Uh, first year. And Juan. Hey, oh, oh. Hey, so, uh, second year from uh, Columbia, am I right? Yes. Great, and then Hui, second year. Hi everyone, Hui. Yeah, um, Hui's from China, but she's in New York, correct? Yeah. Okay, great, terrific. So I'm going to, so the way I will be doing this, I will read out the questions and then I will just ask one or two students to answer that. So the first question is why choose Columbia over other urban planning 
program. So maybe I can choose one student from first year, one from second year. So maybe Brady, if you don't mind going first. Great, yeah. Um, so when I was making the decision, my background coming into this was having spent five years at the Urban Institute uh, in Washington, D.C., studying community development issues. Um, so I wanted a program that had substantial policy grounding, but also one that could stretch me with considerations of the intersection of the built environment and urban design uh, with planning and policy. So this is really the perfect mix of that, having that strong policy focus in UP um, and also being situated within GSAP within the architecture school more broadly. So I saw that as a huge benefit. Um, I think the, the social justice orientation, which Wei Ping, of course, spoke to, um, and really just you can see that even if you look at just the course descriptions um, in that packet, um, in the UP packet. Um, and I think the course descriptions more broadly, uh, one of the most, you know, it's one of the most impressive sets of courses I've seen in any program. So I definitely would encourage you to check that out. Um, I think the focus on practice, um, you know, with that mix of full-time faculty and adjuncts who are working practitioners. So I'm taking a class currently on zoning um, that's being co-taught by the chief planner at Lincoln Center, as well as the former head of Department of City Planning uh, here in New York. Um, and then I think, um, you know, it's really important when going into a planning program to think about the city that you're going to be in. Um, and there's a real benefit to being in a city like New York where so much cutting edge planning is being done. Uh, so you couldn't have a better classroom, I think, than, than here in New York, um, you know, where any issue uh, that you wanna be studying is probably happening here in New York. And I think Columbia does a great job of connecting you with the city um, and being someone who hadn't ever lived in New York prior to this, um, you know, I think you get a really great introduction to, to New York and, and to the issues going on here. Maybe Zeynep? Yeah, I think uh, Brady did a fantastic job of summarizing uh, all the great reasons to choose this program. Um, I think if I had to pick maybe like two main ones, definitely, um, I think being in New York City uh, was one of the one of the main things that swayed my choice. Um, and that's because I think being exposed to the different professional opportunities that you have in the city, and there's such a wide array of them, whether that's in the public sector, in the private sector, you know, international organizations. I'm personally interested in international development. So, you know, being in New York and having large organizations like the UN around the corner, like being able to build those networks uh, while being in grad school uh, was very important for me at least. And so I think that's definitely um, one of the big pluses of this program as well. Okay, so the second question is, how do students receive academic support and are formal informal mentoring opportunities common? So maybe I can ask uh, Xifan first as a second year student and then Moses. All right. Um, so this year we're having uh, writing mentors and digital mentors. I think um, they're both really helpful, although they're our peers, but they can offer a lot, a lot of insightful suggestions. Um, and also I think Emily is really helpful and responsive um, in any academic related issues and also career related issues. She's helping me a lot. And then I think in terms of academic support, um, TAs are good resources. Um, you have to um, contact them a lot for academic support. And also professors themselves are really responsive. Um, not only for academic like Brady and Weeping just mentioned, they're really um, for um, career help because um, there are a lot of them are practitioners and they have networks and all that. So um, it's offering a lot of opportunities. Um, and then uh, in terms of um, mentoring opportunities um, for second year, we have been the mentorship program. Um, it's really helpful for me because um, um, my mentor is um, someone working at Asian Development Bank and she's really helping me to get um, a lot of um, information about working in such an international organization and also for me a lot of um, suggestions on course selection um, and things to do panels to attend. So that's basically my, suggest um, my suggestion today. I think um, I think Shifan gave a great answer and touched on um, a lot of the resources that we have available to us as uh, students at this program. Um, I just wanted to to call out to the fact that um, 
in my experience, I've been so satisfied and, and pleased with the availability of all of my professors and all of my TAs and office hours. And I feel as though, you know, of course, we would all prefer to be um, in a world where we could have fully in-person classes, but the virtual um, nature of office hours right now does, it seems like it allows for a lot more flexibility and a lot more availability. Um, so I feel like that's a great um, way to, to get started and to get to know um, your professors even uh, in this environment. And that's been great. Um, I haven't, uh, since I'm a first year, the um, alumni mentoring is uh, not available to me yet, but uh, the digital and the writing mentors, um, Elaine and Gung Woo, have been super helpful and they have designed uh, workshops for various uh, programs and pieces of software that, um, you know, I coming into this program, I had never um, been familiar with. And um, those workshops have helped me basically from scratch to, to learn uh, Illustrator and InDesign and uh, even some CAD programs. So, um, that mentorship has been really invaluable to me um and um there's also uh there's also a peer matching program uh which is you know kind of a less formal um thing and it's not so much mentorship as it is just creating networks among uh peers within the program but um there has been a lot of um opportunities for academic support and mentorship so far in my experience yeah, thank you. Actually, Moses, you mentioned something I forgot to mention. That is, um, we also run a number of workshops, right, by the mentors and by also professor. And in the spring, we'll have actually an AutoCAD workshop, hopefully. You mentioned CAD. And we're really trying to build up our students' um, technical skills and writing skills, and so not just in the curriculum, but as skill building, more like through boot camps and workshop kind of format. Okay. The third question is, what steps should a student take to make the most out of the two-year program? So I'm going to turn to two second-year students who are, you know, almost there with two years now. So Juan and Hui, if you could share your thoughts. Um, yeah, sure. I would, I would say three things. First, uh, to reach out to other GSEP students, uh, because working with architects, urban designers, uh, real estate developers, um, historic preservation students is one of the most enriching experiences you could have. And uh, you need to seek out those types of spaces. Similarly, reach out to other Columbia schools where other uh, interesting things are happening. For example, uh, CIPA, the School of International Public Affairs has a very strong um, urban policy focus so that's that's something that we can also reach out to um what COVID has also shown us is that a lot of programming is happening a lot of schools all around the world are putting out events and maybe we are a bit saturated by them but uh do your best to actually attend and get uh other types of perspectives or experiences and finally, I would say engage with faculty. Uh, our professors are extremely caring and extremely committed to uh, talking to students and uh, cultivating a relationship with them is uh, critical not only for your time at GSA, but also to your uh, career moving forward. Okay, so I would like to share more about my personal experience because I'm not, I didn't learn any planning knowledge before. So I would say that first year you should just start from something with, that you are familiar with. So I personally learned um, GIS before, so I just started with some urban analytics uh, courses. So the first year I will feel more comfortable in those classes and then you should take the summer for an internship that related to planning because if, if that's still your, your goal. And for the second year, you should just do something that related to planning or more about your interest that you're developing your first year. So I just took some, um, I take some classes that related to 
uh, financing or real estate or international planning because that's still an, another um, concentration for me. So I would say just start it from something with that you're familiar with, then get to know something you don't know before. Um, yeah, and still keep close contact with the faculties because they are super responsive. Okay, so we have the next question. So I maybe just call one at a time. So um, that way we can uh, go over all the questions together. So how competitive is Master of Urban Planning, the degree, how much time did do you invest into studying? So maybe I asked Zainab because you are second year, you probably um, can reflect it a little more. Sure. Um, in terms of being competitive, I think one of the great things about this program is at least for me personally, I've never felt like I've, I'm in competition with any of my peers. In fact, quite the contrary. I think um, we're, you know, on the, I think on the like smaller cohort size and that makes us um, very connected. And, um, and I think we really do try to help each other as much as we can and elevate each other's work. And, you know, if I'm doing something and I, I think it might be of interest to one of my peers, I'll like shoot them an email and be like, hey, you know, check out this lecture or, oh, you mentioned last week that you were interested in this topic or this topic, you should reach out to this person, um, et cetera. Um, in terms of how much time uh, do we invest in studying? A lot, um, but I think that's also the reason why we decided to come back to grad school. Um, for me personally, the first semester of my first year was particularly challenging just because I had been out of school for a long time. And so it was kind of like the first couple of months I was getting my bearings again. But I think, um, again, having very supportive peers was helpful for me to get my bearings. And it's definitely, it requires a lot of time management skills, but it's feasible. And I've been working part time for the past eight months and continuing to pursue this degree. So yeah, it's it's possible. Uh, the next question, um, how is creativity involved in urban planning? What aspect of urban planning requires you to be creative? May I call on Hui? Because I you you worked, we work together in studio, so I kind of know that um, you definitely have encountered that question. Yeah, so I would say that every course is requires your activity uh, and re requires your creativity. Because um, Zainab and I worked on a studio, same studio before, but then we just, uh, that's a long story. But yeah, I think in that process, we all have to you know, start from the ground. So you have to think about, I'm going to work on a, a project, redevelopment project in somewhere else, in somewhere in the Italy, but we are, um, we have no any other sources to find out what happened there. So we have to figure out what kind of sort uh, data sources we have to use, who we need to contact, and um, what should we plan or for that area. That all requires your um, creativity because you have no idea what happens at that place, but you still have to figure out how to plan for that area. So I think we studio did a very good job on that because we just collaborated and we just work on the um, uh, multiple uh, documentations and data sources. And we even get contact with some of the professionals um, at the local university. So um, I like that process because we did successfully um, develop a plan for that area for the station uh, for the train station and for the local housing for the uh, residents so um i like that process because we talk a lot with Wei Ping and francesco during that process and also we um have to use our <laughs> wisdom to do this remotely so that's a big challenge but i i'm very enjoying that process yeah, thank you. Um, how can students get involved with the local community? So whoever, whichever student, I think Huang, maybe you've done some, but I don't know if other students have done some. So whoever wants to um, answer this question, just chime in. Yeah, I, I can start. Um, 
there's a lot of uh, things happening in New York and not only as a result of top-down planning. I think uh, Brady talked about this uh, a couple minutes ago. Um, many, many community organizations are organizing and have uh, a lot of interest in stake to uh, transform the neighborhoods or to um, put into action plans that they developed. Uh, and we could form uh, meaningful relationships with them, but that is something that requires time, that requires effort, and because they they are based on trust. And that is something that uh, I think we're trying to move forward uh, through many instances in within GSAP, um, but that is definitely an opportunity to connect with these types of organizations, to work alongside them, and to uh, be a part of uh, the specific plans or actions that are happening outside of school. Great, yeah, that's great. I would just add to that as well, is that, you know, we, again, we are in New York and we have this opportunity to be connected to all these um, organizations that are doing such great work. And it's really, it's kind of on you to like, you know, make that first step towards them and start to build that relationship. And you have to be, you know, cognizant uh, of their time and also of the amount of time that you're able um, to commit to them. And I think as long as you do try to build that relationship with as much, um, you know, trust and communication as possible, there, there's definitely um, a lot of ways to get involved. Thank you. I think I, I'd add too that I think even through um, the classes, through some of the projects you do with classes, they're very like neighborhood focused and you can kind of get involved with the neighborhoods through that. So for instance, Moses and I are working on a project for a planning methods class um, where we're looking at the effects um, on the restaurant industry and street vendors of COVID in Jackson Heights. Um, so getting to talk to some community organizations and small businesses out there has been great. All right, next question um, is, what is the community like within the cohort? Uh, and at the school. So I'll just open it up, whichever one of you wants to talk quickly. I think Zainab just um, answered it in the last question that we're really um, a friendly cohort and um, everyone's helping each other out and encourage uh, um, everyone out, I think. And personally, um, I'm motivated by others' work too. So um, I think because we choose this program that um, we have some kind of um, similar personality. <laughs> so that's why like we're um, also pursuing similar goals in terms of um, academic or career. That's why like um, it's, I'm enjoying it. Um, and I like everyone here. So I learned a lot. <laughs> I also want to add really quickly, we have a number of student organizations that didn't have a time to do that. So Xifan and Hui on the panel both are um, officers of the Urban China Network. We have uh, quite a number of Chinese students. So this organization hosts uh, uh, annual Urban China Forum this year on COVID and other challenges, you know, not just for China, but beyond. It's very active. Zeynep is uh, one of the editors for the Urban Magazine. And then Juan works with the housing lab. With that's more of a research out, outlet. And so I know there have been questions about how much you can get into research and how can you prepare for your doctoral programs. Uh, and I think the research opportunities tend to be, you have to really look for them, especially in the first year. And for the second year we do, uh, each faculty has a research assistant that's through an application process. And then we look at students, um, uh, abilities and as well as the fit between interests of the student and the faculty. And so I wanted to give you a chance to uh, just to add to what the students are saying in terms of, you know, the research uh, experience and if you want to get to a PhD program afterwards. Every year we have, um, not every year that we have a student admitted to a doctoral program, but at least a couple of students are interested in applying. So um, last year we had um, quite a number of students, three all went into uh, PhD, last two years. 
And so we have our students in all of the major planning programs, not only in the US, but also overseas um, in the PhD program. Okay, so last two questions are more like, what, what is life like in Columbia and New York? Uh, how much does it cost you? Uh, I did say early on, uh, tuition is expensive. New York is not cheap, although I heard that rent is going down, right? Uh, last but not least, what are the top three things you regret doing in Columbia? Um, so, I mean, with that sort of more student life, I like to just open up to the panel. Whoever wants to, you know, wants to chime in, just feel free to do that. Well, it's a it's a bit of a tale of two cities in terms of New York pre and post college, but. Um, what has been surprising to me is how uh, quickly the city has been able to like bounce back into their feet. Um, and I, well, for me, that having always lived in big cities, this is like, the type of environment I'm always comfortable in, in terms of the diversity that you see on the streets, in terms of the possibilities to attend museums and cultural institutions and just engage in pretty much anything your imagination can can take you through so um i think it's a it's a great city a great place to learn a great place to study and a great, and a great place to work uh, in the future And I think to that point of cost in New York, just in terms of living expenses, I think maybe counterintuitively, I, I used to live in DC and I found it a lot cheaper in just daily life here. Um, my grocery bills have gone way down. I have like a local produce stand and a local butcher and local bakery, um, which has been a lot more fun, nice to support small business and a lot cheaper too. And I think on, on transit as well, um, I mean, obviously during the pandemic, we're, we're not necessarily using the, the subway as much, but um, you know, you, you don't need a car here a monthly transit pass is 120 bucks a month, um, which is better than it was in DC and in many other cities. So I think the cost of living is actually pretty good in New York. Anyone wants to tackle the question, what are the top three things you regret doing in Columbia? Maybe the second year students? Yeah, I can start on that. Um, I definitely regret not taking introduction to urban informatics my first year. <laughs> That's like, everybody's smiling because everybody, I say this to people all the time. Um, I think it, um, from my peer, like what I've learned from my peers and now that I am taking it this year, I think back on all of the things I could have uh, done with that knowledge in my first year. And so that's definitely one of my, like just in terms of coursework, um, one of my biggest regrets and maybe also not taking as much advantage of um, being able to take courses in the other schools at Columbia. You know, sometimes we, when registration is around the corner, you know, we think we have like all this time to think about it and then inevitably it goes by quicker than we think. Um, and I think, well, there were three, but those are really the main two I can think of right now if anyone wants to add anything. Um, yeah, maybe to add a little bit on that, I I think I kind of regret not being more uh, curious also about uh, other types of courses during my first year. I set my mind to a specific like track and the the as, like the courses I took were, were good, but now I'm thinking I should have been more like curious with my interests and, and perhaps shop more at, for classes at the start of the semester. These students, um, as you can see, they come really from different backgrounds, different interests. And I'm so proud to see, you know, from first year to second year, they just kind of, there's this huge jump that they move through even uh, from the first to second semester, right? So I encourage you to, uh, talk uh, with them in some depth and also in uh, whatever questions you have. 